chapter one, the orientation. So um, we are going to introduce this chapter just like every anatomy and physiology book starts off with, is what is anatomy and what is physiology. So anatomy is the study of structure. When you study structure, there's a whole lot of ways to look at it. We look at gross anatomy, which isn't like disgusting, but we're talking about like overall. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to work or to watch a, a medical examination, an autopsy or something like that, the very first thing that they do is talk about what they see on the outside. Any bruising, lacerations, anything like that. Um, any compound fractures. So gross is not, like I said, not disgusting. It's just what we see on the surface. Also references macroscopic. Microscopic is cytology and histology. And cytology and histology are two words that you're going to have to become familiar with. Cyto is a study of cells, so cytology, study of cells. Hist histo is tissue, so histology is a study of tissues. And we'll study in just a moment that a group of cells makes up a tissue. So those are the biological levels of organization, and we'll reiterate those pretty shortly. The last type of anatomy is developmental anatomy, and this is the my favorite to teach, and this will be in 2402, but embryology, when we talk about the, the growth and development of an embryo and then to a, a fetus, that's, that's a bunch of fun. That's my favorite topic to teach. So anatomy, study of structure. In order to study structure, you have to understand the terminology, which is really what we're going to focus on for like the first four chapters. Well, it'll be hardcore terminology. In fact, most doctors and physicians use a totally different language, and I kind of feel we call it, and I call it, anatolinguist because they use big words to try to make you feel really incompetent. And if you really listen to what they say, once you understand the language, they're saying very simple things with just very large words, um, like a subcutaneous hematoma. There's no reason to say that. You could say a bruise, and everybody would know what you were talking about. But a lot of times we, they use the terminology to communicate with others, and sometimes doctors just want to feel superior. And I don't blame them if they work very hard. That's fine, but just don't be disrespectful. Also, as we go through the terminology, and I'll say this over and over again, I will teach you different ways to say things, but if your doctor says, this, if you go to work for a doctor, this is the way I want you to say this. Or we don't call it acetabulum. We call it acetabulum. Okay, well, then you say it like your boss tells you to say it. Okay, don't be like, uh-uh. Uh-uh, this is how I learned it, okay? There's a lot of different ways to say it, and you can put the emphasis in, other, in, in different parts of the word. So we'll talk a lot about terminology, and each chapter we'll get deeper and deeper into terminology. Observation is just looking at it. Manipulation is doing what? Like moving it, right? If you have somebody with an injury, a patient comes in, um, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm super sick. But when you're talking to them, having a conversation, which is what most doctors do, they're observing you. If you are super sick, what kind of things are you doing? Do you, are you acting lethargic? Are you laying there? Are you barely breathing? You know, are you gushing blood? Or are you like, hey, doc, what's going on? Da, da, da. Well, I thought, you know, you said you're super sick. Well, I am. I am super sick. So observation and manipulation. We use manipulation, especially when we talk about joints, bones, and stuff like that, to, to manipulate and make sure that they're in their correct socket. They're moving the way that they should be. What's palpitation? Pushing, pushing on it. So like when you lie down and they're pushing to feel that those organs are the size and, and in the position that they should be. So they're kind of, they're, they're not getting deep into it, like cutting you open. They're palpating. Okay, so those are all anatomy terms. Now we get into physiology. Physiology is the function. <clears throat> to study physiology, you first have to understand the anatomy how it's built and, and the structure of it. So every chapter we'll start off with the structure. Then we'll get into the function. And you will learn, if, especially if you've already taken biology and if you took bio with me, structure determines function. There, that is an a, un... I can't use it. I can't figure out the word. You can... Inseparable terms. Structure and function. If you change the structure, you change its function. And in human beings... We all have a specific structure, and if that structure is off, our function is also off. And so one of the very first things that doctors will do is they'll study the anatomy. And if we understand what the damage is anatomically, then we can understand how it impacts the physiology or the function of that. Okay? Um, so our chapters and throughout the rest of this book are going to be divided into organ systems starting with chapter 5. We're going to do basic terminology, chapters 1 through 4. 
And so those are the really the hardest ones to study for. One and two, you'll probably do fine on because you'll overstudy for one and two. And then you'll be like, oh, I did really well on one and two. And then you'll bomb three and four. Historically, that's the way it happens. So I'm going to tell you that so you're preparing ahead of time. Three and four, there's so many terms, and people have a very difficult time connecting abstract terms. So one through four is a lot of terminology. Study hard for three and four. Don't blow it off because one and two, you studied over study four. We'll also look at the cellular level, and the, we're not going to, we will discuss molecular level, but we stay at cells because we'll use microscopes when we're in the lab because we can see those cells. It's really difficult for us to see molecular movement using the microscopes that we have here, the compound microscopes. So we, we will discuss it briefly, but we'll spend most of the time on the cellular level. Any questions so far? Fantastic. So to study physiology, we'll, well, we'll study each system. And that's how this, this book is divided up, and most anatomy books are divided up. And we'll start, OK, this is the integumentary system. Integumentary system is hair, skin, and nails. That'll be chapter five for us. We'll study hair, and we'll go into hair in a whole lot of detail. Then we'll do skin, go into the different layers of the skin, and we'll start very gross, and we'll get to microscopic in each chapter. And then we'll talk about function, OK? Um, when we, we talk about the physiology of things, you'll hear us talking about um, action potential, which is like the electrical currents, and that's how the uh, nervous system communicates. Pressure, using blood pressure, atmospheric pressure, Blood pressure, of course, to circulate blood. Atmospheric pressure so that you can inspire and expire. Um, movement, when we're talking about moving things throughout our digestive system. And that could also be manipulation of your bones and uh, mus muscular system. Basic chemical principles, and that's what we're going to cover in Chapter 2. We will not get into a whole bunch of chemistry because this is anatomy, but we will have to know like sodium, potassium, calcium. Those are things in carbon. You'll hear those over and over again. In this, in this course. And I know I'm talking really fast. I just, we have a lot to cover. Everybody okay with the pace right now? Anybody scared to say anything? Okay, there's the word I was looking for. Anatomy and physiology are inseparable. So structure always determines function. You'll see this in every single life science textbook. So biology or anatomy textbook, you're gonna see structure equals function. You change the structure, you change its function. Structure determines function. All right, levels of organization. You should have studied this in bio, 1406, 1407. Even if you did 08, 09, um, which would be non-majors biology, you still should have studied this. This breaks it down pretty much into the chapters and how we'll cover them. So the second chapter that you and I will cover will be chemistry and biomolecules. So that's why it says chapter two. Chapter three will be the cellular organelles. The cell is the basic unit of life. Okay, good. Way out of biology. So the cell is the basic unit of life, and this is why this chapter is so hard for students to pass that test because they don't understand anything about cells. But we'll like talk about mitochondria, the nucleus, and all that fun stuff in chapter three. So we'll go from molecules to organelles to cells. Then a group of cells is a tissue. A group of tissues. Nobody. It's right there. The answer is always up here. Always. Anytime I ask a rhetorical question, it's because the answer is up there. Anyways, a group of tissues is an organ. Multiple organs working together are an organ system. You have 11 organ systems. Unless you're a hermaphrodite, then you have 12. Organ systems make an organism. So all organ systems working together. Uh, compose an organism. Which organ system of your 11 is the most important? Your skin. Your skin. Skin is super important. They're all the same. Fantastic. You have 11. If I took out my skin, it really wouldn't matter because nothing else would be able to maintain homeostasis, which is a word that we're going to bring in in just a bit. If I took out my nervous system, which would be my brain, spinal cord, and nerves, then nothing else. You could take out, people say all the time, well, your reproductive system, you really don't need that. Actually, you do. Your reproductive system is really important as far as hormones are concerned, and they help you be you. And a lot of times when you do remove the reproductive systems of people, what do we immediately have to put them on? Hormone replacement therapies. 
Yes, because they don't, they don't, their bodies can't maintain homeostasis. They've had all those hormones for their entire life, and all of a sudden, everything's different. And so you'll see a lot of personality changes here. This is just a diagrammatic representation of the terms that we covered on the previous slide. So a group of atoms is a molecule. Molecules make an organelle. Organelles make a cell, and this is just giving you one of the 200 types of cells that we have in our body, but a smooth muscle cell. A bunch of cells make a tissue. A bunch of tissues make an organ. Put a bunch of organs together, you have an organ system. A bunch of organ systems, you have an organism. This, this fella here. Okay? Questions? Comments? Okay. Necessary life functions. You have to be able to do all of these in order to maintain life, which is why they're called the necessary life functions. When we say maintaining boundaries, what do you think that means? We have to be able to maintain boundaries. Personal boundaries. No. Yes. Okay. Keeping organs and systems separated from each other. That's extremely important. What other boundaries do you and I have? Okay. What does that for us? Our skin. Our skin maintains our, our most important boundary keeping what's supposed to be inside of us inside, what's supposed to be outside, outside. We also have, and we'll learn this in Chapter 3, the cell membrane. Our cell membrane keeps what's supposed to be inside our cells inside and what's outside our cells outside. So maintaining boundaries is a necessary function in order to maintain homeostasis. And I'm going to keep saying homeostasis because that's going to lead us into our next topic. What about movement? What do we mean by movement? All living things have to be able to move, especially us. But what am I talking about when I say movement? I mean, obviously, movement is, yeah, you, like you just move. Your muscles and bones, right? But what other type of movement takes place in our body? Breathing, the movement of air in and out, blood flow, oxygen, so that goes along with respiratory. There's a lot of movement that takes place. Anyways, can you and I just stay still and stay sedentary and everything stop and us maintain life? No. We have to continue to move. Responsiveness, what system am I talking about here? Your nervous system. Your brain and spinal cord. Your ability to respond to external stimuli and internal stimuli. Digestion, I feel like everyone understands what digestion is. Okay. But what about metabolism? Because people think that these two things are the same thing. But they are not. And they're not the same thing. Metabolism, you've been taught, okay, well, you have a slow metabolism or I have a fast metabolism. And people think that that means I either break down food really fast or I break down food really slow. And although that is a thing, your metabolism overall is the metabolism of every single cell in your body. So things get built up, we call that anabolic, and things get broken down and we call that catabolic. Everything in your body has to be broken down before it can be used to build something up. So we have to break things down. We have to catabolize them in order to build something up, anabolic reactions. So catabolic and anabolic reactions are what we call our metabolism. And that happens in your skin cells. It does happen in your digestive system for a fact. But it also happens in your eyes, your heart, everywhere. Okay, so catabolic and anabolic reactions are what I'm referencing when I'm talking about metabolism. And every single cell in your body, from your hair, your skin, your lung cell, Ovary cells, kidney cells, they all have their own metabolism. Disposal of waste. What am I talking about here? Pee. Excretory system, removing uh, urine or avoiding your bladder. Sweating. Sweating. And the removal of feces, so part of digestion. Yes, yes. Okay, getting rid of waste. This could also be respiratory waste as well. You could also release carbon dioxide. So getting rid of waste. Why can we not keep waste inside of our bodies? It causes, it is toxic. Eventually, it'll lead to what we call septicemia, which is what? Sepsis, Se sepsis which is what? An infection. An infection of your blood. So you keep all those wastes in you, and then you become septic, and then what happens? You can die. You expire, right? Right, so. Reproduction. The obvious one here is sexual reproduction. They're like, okay, having babies. That is true. But also, we talk about cellular reproduction. So the fact that you have a skin cell here, did you have this skin cell when you were first born? 
No. And were you this size when you were first born? No, I hope not, right? Or your mom's probably still not alive. You once were really small, and your cells reproduced through the process of mitosis, and that's why you got to be this big. And you continue to go through mitosis, which is why you continue to maintain your youthful appearance. What about growth? What's growing? Nothing. Am I just talking about height? But whenever I am talking about height, what is growing there? Your bones. Your bones. Your bones. OK, so growth is your bones. Growth is your muscles. Do your kidneys, did they grow at all? Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. What about your heart? Oh, for sure. Because if all your organs were this size when you were born, yeah, do you see where I'm going? So you continuously grow. The best thing about all this is that because you continuously grow, if you have a bad lifestyle right now and you change your lifestyle, your organs will eventually become super healthy. Now, if you're like terminal, that's not a thing. So I don't mean to say that. So don't be like, oh my gosh. I have a chance. If you've caused irre irreversible damage, then there's not anything that you can do. But like, for example, your skeleton, the skeleton you have right now will be completely different than the one you have three years from now. Okay, your skeleton, which is why people get smaller because their diets change and they get to where they're eating bad food all the time or they're on a fixed income. So you can definitely manipulate all of that. So the next few slides I'm going to go through pretty quickly because we already discussed this. And I wanted to get and pick your brain before I gave you the answers, because if I make you think about it, then you'll probably remember it. So maintaining boundaries, we talked about the cell membranes and the skin to maintain boundaries. Movement, contractility, we talked about muscles. Okay, we talked about bones, just being able to move. We talked about other things moving throughout our body. So smooth muscle moves things throughout our body. Skeletal muscle, and we'll study that in chapter 10, is what moves us around. Cardiac muscle is your what? Cardiac muscle. Yes, your heart. Yeah, there's only one place in your body you're going to find cardiac muscle. Your heart. Responsiveness is your ability to respond to external stimuli. So that's your nervous system. Okay? Um, and your nervous system, all your reflexes are controlled by your nervous system. When it says breathing rate, that is also controlled by your nervous system. Digestion, you and I discussed that the ma majority of us already understand that digestion is taking in and breaking down foods. Metabolism. It uses the term catabolism and anabolism here. Catabolic and anabolic. Those two terms are super, super important. Catabolic and anabolic, okay? So metabolism is a, the, the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in your body overall. And they don't necessarily have to include food. Excretion is getting rid of things. So we talked about sweat. You talked about uh, carbon dioxide. You talked about feces. We talked about urine. Reproduction, cellular, which is mitosis, which is you getting larger over time, and then, of course, the production of offspring, which would be because of sperm and eggs or gametes, and we'll discuss that briefly. But that's actually an A and P2. Growth is just an increase in size of a body, body part, so you got bigger over time, and you continue to grow. You don't stop until you expire. All right. Here it discusses the interdependence of body cells. What does the term interdependence mean? Two things are interdependent. We've actually already answered this question previously in this class today. They rely on each other. They have to be there together. Bottom line. That you can't just have the skin and be like, oh, I have this healthy individual. No, you don't. You have nothing. Okay? It mentions here that humans are multicellular. This is a word that a lot of people struggle with. What does multicellular mean? Multiple cells. Like, don't, over, <laughs> don't overthink it. Multiple cells. You and I are about 100 trillion cells. You're nothing more than a bag of cells. And I'm not trying to ruin your self-esteem right now, but that's what you are, right? You're multicellular. And multi just means more than one, so we're considered multicellular organisms. 100 trillion cells, that's a whole lot of cells. And of course, it mentions the fact that they need each other in order to carry out their functions, OK? Um, it also mentions that each of their functions is specific to a system. Like, you can't expect the nervous system to move your blood, which is why blood can't touch your brain, right? There's that blood-brain barrier, which we will also study in this course. So each system has their own function, but ultimately, they all work together in order to maintain homeostasis or allow you to live. There are 11 body systems. 
and each functional homeostatic human being. This is just giving you a diagrammatic representation of multiple systems working together. So respiratory, digestive, you can see the circulatory system there, excretory with the kidneys, and the bladder, and so on. The next few slides go through the 11 systems. So the integumentary system, and this is just kind of a quick survey to give you a, an idea of what each system entails. And I believe they're presented in the order that we will study them for the rest of the semester. But the first system is the integumentary system, hair, skin, and nails. <clears throat> it also includes glands, like your sweat glands, oil glands. So we'll talk about those as well. The skeletal system is your bones and ligaments. Cartilages are also included in the skeletal system. Your uh, muscle system. When we say muscles, immediately everyone goes to skeletal muscles, which is what we see here. Skeletal muscles, by definition, are muscles that are attached to bone. But you have two other types of muscle. You have the most skeletal muscle. But smooth muscle is muscle within your organs, okay? And then cardiac muscle is your heart, all right? So three types of muscle, skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Then you have your nervous system which includes your brain, spinal cord, and then what we'll end up calling our peripheral nerves. That'll be chapters uh, 11, 12, and 13, I believe, and 14. A lot on the nervous system. The endocrine system is the most under-recognized system. The endocrine system is your hormonal system. I'm going to go back one slide. This system right here, the nervous system, is in charge of communication. A lot of people say, oh, this is a system that controls your entire body. It does control your body, but it's not the only system that controls. The reason why everyone gives this one all the credit is because it controls using electricity. So how fast can a message be sent when I use electricity? Super fast. Like, tell yourself to wiggle your big toe. You're doing it, right? Even I did it, and I knew I was going to. Like, when you tell yourself to wiggle your big toe, you're going to wiggle your big toe. That's your nervous system. Your endocrine system is also responsible for communication. Whenever I told you to wiggle your big toe, how long did you wiggle your big toe? Maybe for a second or so, like not for a very long time. Because you got the message, you did what you're supposed to, and then it was done. So it got there quick and it was over quick. That's electricity. That's the nervous system. The endocrine system uses hormones. Hormones have to travel throughout your blood system. I said blood system, your circulatory system. And so it takes longer. And because it takes longer, we have to release more hormones so it actually lasts longer. So hormones communicate just as much as the nervous system or um, the nerves communicate, the action potentials communicate, but the hormones will communicate slower and it will last longer. The nervous system communicates fast and it lasts not very long at all. When I mentioned that you have 11 systems unless you're a hermaphrodite, just so that you and I are on the same page because many people are like, oh, a hermaphrodite means that you have a penis and a vagina because I have this conversation with my high school students all the time. But that's actually not, that's not correct at all. A hermaphrodite is an organism that has both testes and ovaries. So you actually can't tell a hermaphrodite is a hermaphrodite from the outside. That whole penis and vagina thing, that's like surgically done. And now have there been mutations before where people have accidentally shown up like because they their Hox genes tell them to have two body parts? Yes. And can they have sex with themselves? The answer is no. These are all questions that I've had before that I just want to answer because a lot of people are probably thinking it, but I talk so fast right now to try to get through this. They're like, oh. So you cannot have sex with yourself because technically the physiology of sex, you'd have to have an erection. And if your penis was erect, you couldn't put it into your vagina. It wouldn't work out. The anatomy and the physiology just don't mash. But if you were a hermaphrodite, you're welcome. You weren't ready for that, and I apologize. <laughs> it's like that every day. A hermaphrodite is an organism that has both testes and ovaries. Again, you can't tell that from the outside, but the reason that they find out that they're hermaphrodite is because they end up being sterile. Why? Because the testes produce the hormones that make boys boys, and the ovaries produce the hormones that make girls girls. So if you have both, you're producing low levels of both hormones, so you can't make sperm or eggs. You can still have sex, and that's the thing, is that they continue to have sex, but they can never conceive, and so when they go to the doctor and realize oh, well, you have, and, and they're not, like, huge. Like, if you're a female, you don't have huge testes. They're, what, they're, it's called cryptochitis, and they never descended because obviously you didn't know you had testes, right? Or you would have a scrotum, and then you would be like, oh, I have testes. But you never knew that. So they're inside, up high, really small, and non-functional 
minimally functional. So that's what a hermaphrodite is. Make sure you tell all your friends to quit saying they have a penis and a vagina and that they won't have sex with themselves. You should probably not listen to that lecture at the high school level because that's what it got into. It always does. The next system is the circulatory system, also called the cardiovascular system. You can call it either one and it'd be correct. Ultimately, we call it the cardiovascular system because it has the heart and the vessels. We call it the circulatory system because it circulates blood, oxygen, nutrients, and everything else throughout the body. So either one is correct, okay? But it includes the heart and the blood vessels. Then you have the lymphatic system. This is what people incorrectly reference as the immune system. <clears throat> you don't have an immune system that's an immune system. You have a series of systems that work together to produce immunity, but the lymphatic system is what people reference as their immune system. When they say my immune system is weak, they're referencing their lymphatics, usually. Okay, the lymphatic system runs back ways um, along with veins all the way back to your heart. It picks up waste that are non-blood and filters them out through your lymph nodes. So if there are bacteria or things, uh, viral particles, any type of antigen actually, there, they get stuck in those lymph nodes. Those lymph nodes swell because there's a lot of white blood cells and they're trying to fight off whatever antigen that is, and that's why people know that you have an infection. So a lot of times when you have this random lump that shows up, and that's why doctors always palpate right here, they're trying to fill your lymph nodes in your armpits because if your lymph nodes are enlarged, it's usually because that area is fighting something off. Okay? And are they going to stay large forever? No, just until you're done fighting that off. That's your body's way of trying to maintain homeostasis. So now you know that. Okay, then you have your respiratory system, which is your lungs, your trachea, your bronchioles, your oral cavity, nasal cavity, all of that is respiratory, bringing in carbon dioxide, bringing in oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. Your diaphragm technically is part of the muscular system, but it obviously aids in this as well. The digestive system, this is the one that you've been taught since you were like in third grade when they talked about organ systems, and it actually looks the exact same as it did when you were in third grade, where you have the esophagus and all the related... Um, organs in that system. So we'll cover that in a and 2 as well. Here is the excretory system. Excretory system is the kidneys, ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. So it's what creates and eliminates urine. Excretory system. Okay? And then when we talk about reproductive system, you have the male and female reproductive system. That includes the external anatomy, the penis and the vagina, all the external organs that go along with that. So when we talk about just the endocrine system, we just reference the ovaries and the testes. But the whole reproductive system is all of the anatomy that will come together in order to get the sperm to the egg. So the, the full reproductive system. And we'll study that also in a and 2 That'll be the last system that we study. Questions on the 11 body systems? Nice. All right, survival needs. When, it say, when people say too much of a good thing is a bad thing, in anatomy we go by that all the time. Um, and you'll hear that in the medical field over and over again. People will say, oh, you, I just run all the time, and I'll run all the time. What eventually happens to them? They're doing something good. Running is good, or walking is good, exercising is good. But what happens when you do it too much? Don't you mess up your joints? Yes, you start to cause damage to your cartilages and your bones. And overall, it, it could start wearing you down. Okay, and that also mentally wears you down as well. When you do something too much or you expose yourself to too much, usually it becomes harmful. But if you don't get enough, it's also harmful. Do you need to exercise in order to maintain your health? The answer to that is yes. Even if your exercise is walking to your mailbox. If your mailbox is on your front porch, walk to your neighbor's mailbox. Okay, don't just walk out to your front porch and be like, oh, that's my exercise for the day. You do need to get some type of physical activity in every single day to keep your joints going. When we talk about nutrients, some of you may be super healthy and some of you may be vitamin people. You take a whole bunch of vitamins and then you have this really thick, dark yellow pea. The reason why it's thick and dark and yellow is because you don't need all of that. When your pea is nice and clear, you're getting everything that you need. You don't want dark and yellow. You want a clear pea because when you have a lot of waste in your system, like you take a whole bunch of vitamins, if your pea is a really dark color, or it smells really strong, we need to add some water or take something else out. So when you take too many vitamins, your body sees that as being wasteful 
because if you're not going to use it, your body says we're going to get rid of it. We don't use it, we lose it. So our kidneys are working really hard to get rid of those nutrients. Like too much calcium, huge thing. Can't be doing that. And we'll get there as well. Oxygen, you need oxygen, but you only need a certain amount of oxygen. And if I overfill you with oxygen, there's no carbon dioxide, can't maintain homeostasis, you become super acidic, and then you die. Your organs fail. So you need oxygen, but you also need carbon dioxide. Water, obviously, you need water. And in this time in Texas, you're going to hear people dehydrating, dehydrating, dehydrating. It's because they don't have water. Water is necessary for us to maintain homeostasis and for our cellular metabolism to remain constant. Your cells, when they don't have water, shrivel up. So all of your stuff shrivels up and then it can no longer maintain homeostasis and it causes organ failure. The first system to go is your nervous system, which is why most people feel really dizzy and delirious as soon as they become dehydrated. Okay, the headache and all of that ensues. In order to maintain a body temperature, we say 98.6 and all of the numbers that you're gonna see in, throughout this entire book are textbook numbers. These are textbook numbers that we tell you 98.6, but are you gonna have a patient that's gonna have a normal basal body temperature of 97? Yes. And are you going to have one that normally has a 99.1? Yes. It just depends on their normal basal metabolic rate. Some of them really have a high active metabolic rate, and so they have a higher body temperature. And then there's lower. And if you're a female, your temperature gets really high, and then it gets really low because it fluctuates with hormones. So when we use all these numbers, ultimately these are just textbook numbers, but maintaining whatever your normal body temperature is. And if you do become a physician, a nurse, a doctor, or anything like that, it's very important that you have a baseline of your regular patients, like you know where their normal body temperature is, at least for reference points. Appropriate atmospheric temperatures, we're talking about the pressure for you that's needed for you to breathe in and breathe out. Inspire and expire is what we end up calling that. If there's too much pressure, then it's going to cause damage. If there's not enough pressure, it's going to cause damage. So, well, you're going to suffocate. But survival needs. The nutrients, and it's going to go into each of these briefly. But nutrients talk about the things that you need, whether it's um, vitamins and minerals or whether you're eating various foods. Those of you uh, right now in the whole health and wellness world, like your uh, macromolecules are a really big thing. So it mentions the carbohydrates, fats, proteins. That's what we're going to actually cover in Chapter 2 a little bit as well. So you need each of those in certain amounts, but you don't want too many of one or not enough of one. Oxygen. We talk about oxygen for the uh, respiratory reasons, but also for ATP production. Does anyone know what ATP is? Like throwback in high school, you're, you had a really awesome biology teacher who told you what ATP was. Kristen, no pressure. ATP is your energy, your metabolic energy that's made by your mitochondria. Right now, everything you're doing is requiring ATP. Your body makes exactly enough ATP for you to do what you do on a regular basis. You have to have oxygen to create ATP, energy. If you don't have oxygen, you don't have energy. So when you die, you'll have oxygen. Your systems still go for a little while, but they'll slowly stop when they run out of ATP. When we run out of ATP, our muscles stop, which leads to what? rigor mortis yes so we get stuck in that position so oxygen and obviously you talk look, look at it as the respiratory gas but you and I are also going to talk about the ATP production and the energy relationship there I love ATP topics water we've already talked about water of course that's super important the normal body temperature again it's giving you a textbook number yours might be a little higher a little lower <laughs> your patients as well what happens to the rate of chemical reactions when you get warmer? It speeds up. Fantastic. What happens when you get colder? It slows down. That is exactly what you would expect to see. When we have a patient that runs a fever, we expect that their metabolic rates are a little bit higher. But what's the problem with running a fever for too long or one that's too high? They do. And what organ starts first? Your brain. Your brain will shut down first under uh, high temperatures for an extended period of time because your brain, if you took your brain out of your head right now, I don't know how many of you have seen an autopsy or run on different things. Your brain right now, if you were to touch it, your finger would go right through it. It's the consistency of a tub of butter that you've left out overnight. Like it is 
So even when they do autopsies, they can't give you anything on the brain for at least two weeks because they have to remove the brain and they have to preserve it. They used to freeze it, now we just soak it in formalin and then we bread loaf it, we cut it. So your brain, if your body gets too hot, guess what it does? It liquefies and you change its shape, you change its bottom line. That's why we don't want people to run fevers, high fevers for an extended period of time. Why is this an issue with infants? Their, their skull hasn't solidified yet, but that's not the issue. The issue with infants is that, that they cannot maintain their own body temperature. They're relying on you to maintain their own body temperature. If you have any kids, any of you who are parents, you know you wrap your kid up and they're nice and warm, they fall asleep, and they wake up because they're hot and they start crying and you unwrap them and they cool off and they go back to sleep. And they start crying because they're cold. And you're like, ha, ah, okay, I know. I know, but you love your kids, so you keep doing that, okay? The gas, the atmospheric pressure, I already mentioned that, adequate for breathing in and out, inhaling, exhaling, expiration. Here's our big word, homeostasis. Homeostasis, bottom line, is the internal balance. It's your internal balance, and every single day, your body's goal is to maintain homeostasis. If you have a headache right now, raise your hand, okay? Good, that makes me happy. All right? If you're hungry right now, raise your hand. I stay hungry, though. You're non-homeostatic. If you are wanting anything at any certain point or you feel the need to do something, you're non-homeostatic. Your body cannot maintain homeostasis if you need something. Like if you need food, and why can our body make our own food? No. It will start breaking itself down if it needs to, if you starve yourself, but that's in extreme conditions. But if you need food, some of you will first, your stomach will start growling. And then if you go for a really long time without getting food, you'll start to get a headache. Or you'll start to feel tired. That's your body's way of saying, look, we're trying to maintain homeostasis, but we need a little bit more nutrients. So I need you to eat. So how do you fix that? You eat. Okay? You maintain homeostasis. You find the problem. You fix it. And then you're, you're back to homeostasis. If you're sweating, what do you need to do? Cool off. And if you're cold, you need to warm up. Like, they're simple things, but these are signals that your body is sending you because it can't do it. It can't do it. The only reason you are ever aware of a problem is because your body can't fix it. If you have a headache, if you're hungry, uh, if you break your toe in that pain, your body can't fix it right then. It's going to need a little bit of help, and then it will work on repairing it. And if you decide not to get the help, will it eventually heal that toe? Yes. Will it be exactly where it needs to be? Probably not. What was your question, dear? This may be so silly. Okay, it's okay with silly. Okay, so people that fast. Fast, uh-huh. What happens with that? You know, they get the headache. Oh, yeah. Crazy, oh, yeah. And then they do it for, like, let's say two or three weeks. Oh, yeah. So what happens to homeostasis? Okay, so they, 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 first of all, they have the headaches, they're fasting, but after about eight to ten days of that fasting, their body realizes that this is a pattern. Okay, so it adjusts. Mm -hmm. It will adjust short term. Um, I have multiple students who fast. And the one thing, like I get the whole purpose of it, but guess what they do as soon as the sun goes down? Like they just take in all of these nutrients. So it actually is doing the opposite as far as what the, but their body knows, okay, if I wait, there's a time when I'm going to get those nutrients. Okay. So that's what fasting does, especially if it's for religious purposes. Now, if you're just talking about fasting um, for weight loss purposes, it's ineffective. It actually slows your metabolism down. So the best thing that you can do as far as weight loss is concerned is continue to take in small amounts of nutrients and continue to work your metabolism. But your body will adjust to whatever you ask it to do. Um, full, full adjustment is 21 days. A full pattern adjustment is 21 days. Did I cover everything on here? Yeah, I think so. Any questions on homeostasis? Um, whenever we talk about trying to maintain homeostasis, the only way that our body, if our body can't do it, it has to communicate to us. And the big thing here in the word that I'm trying to get at is communication. There has to be some type of communication with yourself, your body, and within your own body's organ systems so that they can say, hey, we have a little bit of pain here uh, or we have a cut here. We need some white blood cells over here to help fight off any type of infection or antigen. Like there's constant communication. 
What two systems are responsible for those communications? Nervous, Nervous and endocrine. <laughs> yeah. Rhetorical question. If the rhetorical question shows up, the answers are up here. Here are my two main systems for communication. As far as whether or not they're more important than another system, that's not a thing. Because remember, we already said that they're all equally important. But these are the two main ones that are responsible for communicating. Again, the nervous system uses electricity and it travels really quickly, but it doesn't last very long. The endocrine system uses chemicals, it uses hormones, travels slowly, and the duration is usually longer. Okay? So communication is how we continue to maintain homeostasis. If we don't know there's a problem, we don't know how to fix it. Okay? So this gets us into the way that our communication works, and this is kind of like a preface to the nervous system chapter. But it's one slide and then we, we move on. So in order for us to realize we have a problem, we have to have something that receives that message that says we have a problem. So we call that sensor a receptor. So ultimately, your sensory information, it gathers stimuli from your external environment. Any sensory information that your body takes in travels in this direction. It travels from outside to the middle. So we end up calling this afferent traveling. Any sensory information goes up, okay? Your control center, where in your body do you think your control center is? Very well. Your brain and spinal cord. Your control center is your brain and spinal cord, which is why the information travels in this direction. It travels towards the control center and says, here's what we sense. What do we do with it? And then the control center says, oh, well, we're sensing that you're touching something that's burning. So as a result, you should probably... Remove your hand from that. And that's what we call our effector. It will send a message right back down. Any effector will send it down. We call it, we're going to end up calling that efferent travel. Efferent, effector. So that's how I remember that. And I'm a huge nerd, so I'll tell you my study strategies as I go through it. Like efferent, effector. If you can't get those two the same. Anyway, efferent, and it'll say, oh, move your hand, right? So you're touching something that's really hot, that's stimulatory. My sensory information travels afferently. Afferent ascending goes to my control center. My control center says, oh, don't touch that. You're going to get damaged. Efferent motor tells me to move. This is just a quick, quick preface to our four chapters on the nervous system. But we end up calling this the feedback loop. So we receive the information, we process it, and then we respond to it. This is what you do in a normal everyday life in every situation. You receive information, you process it, and you respond to it. Your phone is ringing, you realize it's somebody you don't want to talk to, you respond, you ignore it. Your phone is ringing, it's somebody you do want to talk to, your control center says, ooh, answer that, and you answer that. Okay, so it's nothing different. It's not like this is this whole huge scientific thing that nobody really knew. You do this all the time. Questions or uh, concerns on this? Anything that I can clarify? All right, so this is just giving you the balance on that, so... The balance is so that you maintain homeostasis. This is showing that, you, that it's imbalanced, like you're touching something or you're sweating. It sends that message to the control center. Here's the first time it uses the word afferent because it's traveling up. The control center will send that message back down to the effector, and that's an efferent pathway. Do you see how? Anyway, it's coming down, and then its goal is to get that balance. And what's the word we use for balance? Homeostasis. We're going to learn a word in chapter two called equilibrium. Those two words are not interchangeable. Homeostasis applies to something that's living, like an organism. Equilibrium applies to a liquid or a chemical situation. Okay? So when um, sometimes a lot of people are like, oh, well, their equilibrium is off. The reason why they're saying that is because there's fluid in their ear, and the equilibrium is balance. That's not the same thing as homeostasis. Okay? making sure that you have the right terminology. Difference between negative feedback and positive feedback. That's what these next few slides are about. Negative feedback and positive feedback. Negative feedback says there's a problem. So it tells you there's a problem, and guess what you do? You fix it. Okay? If you don't fix it, what will happen? You will die. You may or may not die, but it will continue to cause damage. All right. <clears throat> Negative feedback says that your body tells you you have a problem, and then as a result, you do something to fix it. All right. I often parallel this um, 
with those little planners that your kids use or your brothers and sisters, whoever you, but those planners that those teachers use that you're supposed to sign every single night. And I'm a bad parent because a lot of times I forget to sign them and then I get a little sad face the next day or Isaiah doesn't get to play at recess because his mom didn't sign his planner and I feel like a crap head. But the, the purpose of the planner is the teacher can send a message like, Isaiah hit Mason in the face today. Sad face. Then that message makes it to me as the parent, the control center, and I'm like, Z, did you hit Mason in the face today? Yes, ma'am. All right, you know you're not supposed to hit Mason in the face? Yes, ma'am. All right, cool. Then I sign it, telling the teacher, okay, I handled that situation, and then I send it back to her. Like, you sent me some negative information, I've corrected the problem, and now I'm sending it back. We're trying to maintain balance, okay? That's what negative feedback is. Two ways that our body does this. When we try to control our body temperature, if you get really warm, you'll start doing what? Sweating. Okay, when you sweat, the physiology of sweat is that the, the water, which is not really water, but we'll say the water and all the other solutes that are with it are heated up to the point where they start to pull away from your body. They evaporate. And when they evaporate, they pull the heat with it, cooling your body. That's what sweat's supposed to do. Okay, when you're cold, what do you do? Shiver. When you shiver, and we're going to learn this in chapter 5, every single hair in your body, on your body, has one muscle. It's called the erector pili muscle. When you shiver, all of those hairs stand out. Okay? And that's technically like a vestigial structure because it's supposed to look a, make us look really, really big when we're scared so that things go away from us. But some of us just aren't as hairy as others. Anyways, the reason those muscles contract is because when a muscle contracts, it releases ATP, which is energy, and energy is heat. So it's supposed to warm us up. So we're trying to maintain homeostasis. When we're hot, we sweat, we cool off. When we're cold, we shiver, we warm up. It also talks about the regulation of blood volume by ADH. ADH is an acronym for a hormone that you and I are going to study over and over again. It's called antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic hormone is released from the kidneys. Okay? Um, what antidiuretic hormone does is it determines whether or not you should pee. So, if, you are, if there is no ADH being released, if your kidneys are not releasing ADH, you're peeing, which means you're adequately hydrated. The goal is that you pee often, okay, because you're adequately hydrated. In the event that you are not adequately hydrated, your kidneys say, uh-oh, her water levels are low, it will release ADH. ADH is a hormone, antidiuretic. It will cause your kidneys to stop making urine and keep the fluid in your body. So it's trying to help you stay hydrated. ADH is the way that your body tries to maintain the blood volume. The more dehydrated you become, the more viscous your blood becomes. Your blood is supposed to run very smoothly, but if you become dehydrated, it starts, it starts slugging down, okay? Now, ADH is inhibited by alcohol and drugs. So, if you are consuming alcohol or drugs, ADH says, oh, you're adequately hydrated, so you pee a lot. And then what happens the next morning? Yeah, you're extremely dehydrated, severely dehydrated, because ADH was inhibited throughout the entire time you were consuming alcohol. So you were really, really dehydrated, and now you have a horrible headache and you feel like trash. And even though you don't want to drink water, what's the best thing you should do? Drink water. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so ADH and negative feedback. Questions on negative feedback? Okay, so that's our whole balance thing, and it's using the sweating and the shivering, a diagrammatic representation for that. Okay, and this is explaining the ADH regulation. So using antidiuretic, I explained it. Here it is in writing. Okay, the opposite of negative feedback is... Positive feedback. Positive feedback is not what you think it is. Like where your body's like, you're doing a great job. It's not doing that at all. In fact, there are just a few actual representations or examples that you can use for positive feedback. One of those being uterine contractions during delivering a baby. When a woman first has the first contraction, does the baby shoot out? No. No, it doesn't. Okay. The first contraction is stimulated by a hormone called oxytocin. 
unless you're being induced, and then it's called Pitocin because it's a synthetic version of it. Oxytocin sends a message to the uterus that says, squeeze. The uterus will contract, but the baby doesn't move. And then it sends a message back to the brain, and it says, brain, the baby didn't move. And the brain says, more power. And it sends another surge, a larger surge of oxytocin down. But oxytocin is a hormone, so does it get there fast or slow? Slowly. So a woman could have a first contraction up to three or four weeks before she actually even delivers that baby. And she can have regular contractions every few hours, two weeks before she has the baby. So when women are like, oh, I'm having a contraction, I'm going to have a baby, that's usually because it's your first kid. By the time you have, like, four kids... You're like, oh, I'm going to have contractions for four days, and I'll walk in that hospital when that baby's on its way out. Like, I'm not going to stay there the whole time. Okay? It says more power, and it squeezes the uterus. Sends more oxytocin. Sends a message back to the brain and says, the baby's still here. And the brain says, oh, more power. And it sends more oxytocin. And it will continue this cycle for hours until the blood levels of oxytocin are so high that the contractions are about a minute or two apart. And then guess what eventually happens? That baby shoots out, hopefully, right? And if not, then you get a C-section. So we want, that to, we want that to happen. But positive feedback means that it continues to enhance the response until something physically stops it. So a cascading or amplifying action. We increase the amount of oxytocin until that baby is physically removed, Okay. We continue, we continue, we continue to release and create more oxytocin until that baby is is removed from the body. And when that baby's finally removed, do those contractions stop? The answer is no. The contractions don't stop because you have so much oxytocin in your blood. Your contractions can last for hours and sometimes days. Okay? And then if you decide to nurse or breastfeed, you're, you're in it for the long run. Okay, so positive feedback, it continues to amplify or get worse and worse until something physically stops it. This is the second example, blood clotting. So you have a laceration or something that has caused you to bleed. We will immediately begin to start. These little things here are chemicals. Chemicals will show up and say, hey, you've been damaged. And then platelets will stick. I just spit. I spit a lot when I get excited about talking. Um, platelets will begin to stick there and we'll have a, an accumulation of more and more adherence and more and more platelets until we physically stop all the bleeding. So we've created a blood clot. So we don't thin it out. We make it bigger and bigger and bigger until it physically stops. So positive feedback makes it, enhances it until something physically stops it. Negative feedback says we have a problem, we fix it. A problem, we fix it. Okay. On the disturbance of homeostasis, Anytime you're out non-homeostatic, we call that a disturbance of homeostasis. If you have the flu, that's an extreme extur- disturbance of homeostasis. If you have um, shingles or anything like that, that's a an, an disturbance of homeostasis. So if you're sick, right? But what if you're one of those people who's continuously sick? Ultimately, what that does is it weakens your systems. Because at first, your systems are on high guard and they're overworking, but eventually they slow down and and begin to to stop working the way they're supposed to. So that eventually leads to diseases, okay? In the event, oh, also, every single chapter, I'm glad it says that right here, every single chapter you'll know we're getting to the end when we start talking about what happens when you get old. Overall, if you just let yourself age the way that you let yourself age, eventually your systems are going to slowly start to shut down, which is going to lead to your natural death, okay? Hopefully it's a natural death, right? And we'll talk about ways to curtail all of that in most of our chapters. If negative feedback mechanisms are overwhelmed, if there's so many things wrong with you, positive feedback takes over. And when positive feedback takes over, that usually sends you into cardiac arrest and you you die. Right. So if there's so many things that are wrong, like especially if you've been in just a really traumatic accident or something like that, there's too many systems that are trying to, trying to balance or maintain homeostasis. Positive feedback will take over, and that patient will normally expire. Okay, so um, ultimately, your body's goal is to maintain homeostasis. Your goal should also be to maintain your own 
homeostasis. All right. <clears throat> At the end of this chapter, so this last section, is talking about anatomical position and um, the serous membranes. So many of you may or may not already be aware of anatomical position, especially those of you who are already in the field or have been in doctor's offices. Um, anatomical position, we, we talk about the pinkies touching the thighs, and when we get into the um, bones and the joints chapter, we'll actually like move all of this stuff around, and we'll stand up and do that. But anatomical position, your body should be flat, and your pinky is touching your thighs. It should not be your thumbs to your thighs. Okay, um, and that'll be, you'll see that in the labs and all of that as well. So pinkies to the thighs, and if you are, if the uh, ventral side is up, so belly up, we call that supine, and if it's back up or the um, dorsal, we call that prone. So supine, prone, supine, prone. So um, normally, if you were my high school kids, and I knew you a little bit better because we've been, you know, we would do this all together and be prone, it's fine, but we're not going to do all that, okay? So you're just going to have to take my, my word for it. Um, I already said that. We always, 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 if you're a doctor, if you're a, an EMT, a paramedic, anybody talking about a patient, you always use the patient's directional terms or not, you, or, or else you will be sued. Um, when you say we're going to operate on their left leg, it's their left leg. So when you're looking at your patient, their left leg, okay, is a cross. So this is what gets people on our final exam, too, is because I ask you directional terms, and you're looking at the patient, but you give me your, your direction. And so you're like, oh, right atrium, right ventricle, and it's the left and left or whatever, okay? When you're looking at your patient, it's the opposite of whatever you would naturally think. Also, this is what causes a lot of lawsuits, and that's why when... If you do have surgeries on any directional part of your body, how many people come talk to you before they actually do the surgery? Yeah, you should, it should be a minimum of three people. It should be somebody coming in, hi, what's your name? What's your birthday? They, they ask you all these questions, and they're checking it off. Okay, what are we doing for you today? Oh, well, you're going to reset my left leg. Okay, show me. And then they'll usually initial it. They'll take a marker and initial it. Then somebody else will come in. Hi, I'm so-and-so, so-and-so. Can you please tell me your name, your birthday? This is because we've been sued so many times because you're supposed to be amputating the right arm and they show up and, and they still have the right arm. The left arm is gone. Okay? And that stuff happens still. So make sure you're talking about your patient, not your, yourself. Okay? Not the observer, your patient. It happens quite often. General terminology, we're not going to go through every single one of these. You can clearly look at this diagram. Um, these are terms that we use to reference different regions of the body. Um, when we say anterior and ventral, we'll get into this in just a moment, that's usually the front. Anterior and ventral can usually be used interchangeably on human. So um, that's the front view. Okay, and the opposite of that would be posterior or dorsal. And I thought that picture was next, but obviously it's not. All right. These right here, I told you the first few chapters are going to be really heavy in terminology. The whole diagram is here, and it gives you the term. So when you say superior, superior overall means above, okay? So if, if your patient is staying, standing and, and facing you and speaking to you, superior means that. But what if they're lying on their back, and what if they're in a supine position? When you say superior, you're moving towards the cranium, okay? You're moving towards the head. You don't just immediately think because they're lying on their back that there's no longer, like you're doing superior from this way, okay? We're doing it towards, towards the cranium. So like the thymus will always be, or the thyroid will always be superior to the thymus. So it's like that whether I'm standing straight up or whether I'm lying supine and you're uh, doing an examination. Inferior means underneath it. And if that individual is lying again, in a supine position. Inferior does not mean like buried in the organs, okay? Inferior means that we're moving towards the caudal origin of that, or the caudal region of that patient, so towards the tailbone, okay? So inferior portion. Superior, inferior. <clears throat> Ventral and dorsal, and you can see here that we have um, sister terms that are listed there next to them because they're often used interchangeably. And it really, when you learn it, you need to learn both terms. 
because you don't know who you're going to work with. Some of you are going to work in an office setting. Some of you are going to have your own practice, and you'll choose which ones you like better. But you have to know both of them because when you're having a conversation with someone, if, you're, if they're talking about ventral and you're like, I'm not really, you need to know that ventral and anterior are the same thing. Just because you choose to use anterior doesn't mean that ventral is wrong. So ventral or anterior is the front portion going towards the front of that uh, individual. Dorsal or uh, posterior is the back. And I always remember the dorsal fin of a shark. Like that's just, it's on the back. So that's how I remember dorsal all the time. Especially if you're just learning these terms, you need to come up with ways to memorize them because these are types of terms that don't change. Like they're always, always, always going to be the same. Medial versus lateral. Medial means towards the middle. Lateral means towards the outside. This is a point of reference. Okay, so um, you can use this whether your patient's standing or whether they're lying down, but medial means towards the middle, lateral means on the outside, intermediate means somewhere between. So like you would say that my nose is medial to my ears or to my eyes, my ears are lateral to my nose, okay? You always go with the point of origin, and if they don't give you a starting point, you always mention, it always starts here. So if they say, oh, it's lateral on that patient, this is the understood point of origin. We're going to end up calling this the mediastinum. Most of the time, when they're talking about facial features, they're going to give you, like, from your nose, where is it? Well, it's lateral. Or from your ears, okay, well, it's medial. But if there is no reference point given, it's always, always this area right here, and we're going to learn in just a moment, that's called the mediastinum. So this is the given point of reference. So medial, middle, lateral, the outsides, and intermediate in between those two. Questions or clarification needed? Okay, proximal distal. Proximal and distal are terms that you only use when you're referencing your limbs. Proximal, uh, we, I have heard people use it not referencing their limbs, but it wasn't used correctly. Proximal and distal mean, proximal is close to the point of attachment, distal means far from the point of attachment. So like for example, the point of attachment right here for my upper limb would be the glenohumeral joint right here. Okay, so my wrist is distal, my elbow would be proximal, like it's closer to that point of attachment, okay? So you use that with your limbs. You'll do the same thing with your lower legs. So distal and it would be far from the point of attachment, proximal would be close to that point of attachment. Superficial means on the surface or towards the surface. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the surface, but it's towards that surface. Um, we, we would talk about like superficial laceration, superficial bruising, superficial things like that. Deep is the opposite of superficial. So that would be something that's more towards the core of that organism. Also, there's another word that's used here um, throughout the text. Called, it's reticular. Reticular also tells us it's a little bit deeper. Um, reticular. We'll get into that shortly. And we're almost to the end of this chapter. I know it wears me out too. Two major divisions of your body. Axial is in the middle. Appendicular are your arms and legs. Why do we have divisions of our body? Why don't we just say it's your body? Why divisions? How many know where your cervical region is? Yeah, it's those, these are terms that you have to be familiar with. So cervical, you have your cervical vertebrae, which are up here. But if you're a woman, you also have a cervix, which is the portion of your uterus that has to dilate 10 centimeters. So we have to make sure that you're familiar with terms because if you just say body, it's really vague. Can you give me a little bit more information? Okay. So we use these regional terms and the terms that we're going to use in these first four chapters to really designate what it is that we're specifically referencing. Okay. So again, this is the exact same diagram I showed you previously with those terms, different regions. And we will learn all of these, just not today. Okay. Anatomical variability. What you need to understand overall is that although most of this textbook applies to you, are you unique? Yes. Is the person like next to you the exact same as you? No. Is medicine that works for them going to work for you? No. We're mostly the same, but we're very different. So that's what this slide is basically saying. 
But if you were too different, it would be inconsistent with life and you would be, you'd be dead. Inconsistent with life would mean that you are, you are dead. So extreme variations are inconsistent with life, which means if you were an infant, you would miscarry. Like most of our miscarriages are results of extreme inconsistencies usually chromosomal, but we'll get there, okay? So you might be different, like you might be missing a bone or you might have extra muscles or ve blood vessels or whatever, but most of us are generally the same. Body planes and the sectionings, um, we, when we talk about our bodies, we can cut our bodies into three planes, which is what we're about to look at, and then the body regions or sections. The body planes, sagittal divides you into right and left. Sagittal sectioning divides you into right and left. So right down between your eyes would be mid-sagittal. Sagittal is right and left. Frontal is right, like front and back, or anterior and posterior um, planes. So we cut you in half. And it's actually also called the coronal view because it goes along the coronal suture. So it just cuts you right here. So sagittal cuts you between the eyes into left and right. Frontal cuts you into anterior and posterior and then transverse cuts you anywhere into superior and inferior portions, okay? So sagittal is right and left. Frontal is anterior and posterior. And transverse is inferior and superior. Oh, I did say coronal. Good. It's there. And these next few slides give you a little bit more detail. So sagittal, right down... Um, right down the middle, left and right halves. If you are not right down the middle, we will call it parasagittal. So if you cut someone here, then that's parasagittal because it's not on their midline. Has any, have any of you been to that exhibit called Body Worlds where they plasticize those bodies and then they section them? It's crazy awesome, but that, that would really make, if you, understood, if you saw that, you would see what I was talking about. Like we can cut those people because we took their human body and we filled them with plastic because they donated their bodies to science, you can cut them into different sections so that you can view the internal anatomy. It's extremely amazing. It's usually $20 a person to get in. It's totally worth it. You should do it. Totally worth it. But it, they travel all over the world. Like the last time they were in Texas was like eight years ago. So they'll probably not be back for a while. Mid-sagittal is in the middle. Parasagittal, not in the middle. Then there's frontal. Frontal, also called coronal, divides you into anterior and posterior. Transverse. Um, superior and inferior. As we start to look at diagrams, when, once we get past this chapter, I'll ask you, what cut is this? What cut is this? Because the only way you get really good at things is if you practice them. So I'll say, what view are we looking at right here? And you'll say sagittal or frontal or transverse. And then my next question is, where? If it's transverse, where is it? Like I want you to look at the organs and say, oh, well, that's a cut right here or that's a cut on their leg. You want to look at that anatomy and be able to recognize it. An oblique section is anything that does not make a 90-degree angle. So any oblique sectioning could be like 45. Say, and when you think of obliques, you think about the sides of your, your abdominals. And I get that. But it's anything that's not a 90-degree sectioning. So anything off one of those three planes is oblique. Questions on those terms? Here's each of those cuts, okay? Like you would put those people sagittal here in the middle, right and left, transverse, superior and inferior, and then frontal or coronal into anterior and posterior. Right here, this is a transverse sectioning. Can you tell me about where this is? They have the organs labeled right now, so it should be a little easier to identify the region. Okay? Just under your chest. And you would know that it was just under your chest because you can see the different, like here's the pancreas, so we know that we're getting to a little bit lower in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Can you tell me which part of this is anterior and which part is posterior? Which part is the front? Which part is the back of that individual? How do you know? Very well. Right here is the vertebral column. So this is dorsal. This is their back. And that's one of those things I'm going to teach you, and if you didn't know that, that's fine. But you want to navigate. You want to orient yourself immediately. When you show up, I want you, whether it's on scene, in surgery, in the office, wherever, I want you to be a boss. 
Like you walk in, not cocky, but confident. Like I know exactly what I'm looking at or you know the questions and how to orient yourself. You know the stuff well enough. So yes, I always look for where is my vertebral column. Can I see a spinal column? And if I can, I know that that's the dorsal part of that organism. And then I try to navigate myself around after that. So yes, this is the back, that's the front. You can see here a total frontal cut. You can see shoulders and everything here. Lungs, both lungs. You can see the abdominal organs. And here, sagittal, again, my thing, find my, my uh, vertebral column. So I know that this is the dorsal, this is the ventral. So I always find that spinal column, that vertebral column first to navigate myself. You, with human anatomy and physiology, that works out for you. With other you know, things, it doesn't. But anyways, body cavities. Dorsal and ventral, guess where dorsal is? And back, yep, ventral, front, outstanding. Okay, I am a chart maker, and I'm going to do it quickly because I don't want to spend any more time. But I divide things up, so I will put dorsal, and I don't have a bunch of board space, so I apologize, and ventral. It's telling you right here that the ventral cavity, or the dorsal cavity, can be divided into two parts. You have your cranial and then your vertebral. Any idea what would be in your cranial cavity? Your brain, fantastic. And what would be in your vertebral cavity? Spinal cord, yes. Okay, so that's dorsal. And those are the only two in the um, dorsal body cavity. Okay, here it shows you, what cut is this, first of all? Somebody said. It's sagittal. Yes, this is sagittal. Okay, what cut is this? Frontal, yes, because you can see across both sides. It's anterior and posterior. This is the best view of the dorsal cavity. You can see the cranial and the vertebral cavity. Also, these are continuous. Like, there's nothing that divides it and says, oh, that's the end of that. We use these terms so that we generally know where we're at. So if I say the cranial cavity, I would expect you to know that I'm talking about where? Somewhere towards the brain, yes. Okay, and if you're looking at the vertebral cavity, you know that they're dealing somewhere with the spinal cord, something along those lines. So you use them for regional reference. Okay, now to the Ventral body cavity. Ventral ca body cavity has a lot more divisions. So I'm going to stretch it so that I have more room. And I do normally write very neat, but I don't have a lot of space. So, Anyways, thoracic and then abdominopelvic. So two main subdivisions, the thoracic and abdominal pelvic, just using those terms, just using those terms, what do you think I'm talking about, thoracic? In your chest region, abdominal pelvic? Abdominal area, yes, 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 yes. It does mention here that those two regions are separated by your diaphragm, and I'll show you what I'm talking about shortly. But it would be super nice if they just, the division stopped right there, but they don't. The thoracic cavity can be further divided into three separate cavities. So we have the pleural cavity, and I do misspell things all the time, oh, just like I did right here. The pleural cavity, pleural is lungs, and then there's the mediastinum, which is that reference point I, I mentioned earlier, the mediastinum. And then pleural mediastinum in the uh, pericardial cavity. And guess what's in the pericardial cavity? A little heart. How many lungs do you have? Two. You should. Some of you may have just one. So you actually have two pleural cavities. Your lungs are not housed together. They're housed separately. So that's when I mentioned just a moment ago some of you may just have one. It is totally possible to have one lung completely removed or damaged and be perfectly fine. Um, the other lung will compensate for what that other lung, that the, the missing lung did. So the thoracic cavity can be further subdivided into two pleural cavities. So pleural tells me I'm dealing with my lungs. 
the mediastinal cavity, and then the pericardial cavity, which is the heart. Okay? Just using context clues, what do you think the two regions of the abdominal pelvic are? Yes, the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. Okay? And, but there's no division there. So the abdominal cavity is, contains most of your more superior organs, your stomach, intestine, spleen, and liver, your pelvic cavity, your urinary organs, and your reproductive organs as well. So there's no physical separation. It's just kind of giving you a reference point. Now, here in this frontal view, you can see here's the thoracic cavity. So altogether, this is the thoracic cavity. I have two pleural cavities one pericardial cavity, and here's my mediastinum, okay? So two pleural, one pericardial, and then the mediastinum. But there's actually little gaps here. Why is that? <clears throat> Excuse me, why are, is that? Do you think that these organs touch? No. They don't. They're completely separated from all of the other ones. There is no other organs that directly touch the lungs or the heart or the mediastinum. So that's why those separations are there. Right here, this is depicting the diaphragm. These are all vital organs, so they all have their own separate cavity. Then we have the diaphragm, now we have our abdominal pelvic. Abdominal and then pelvic. There is no physical separation here. This is just giving you a, reason, a region, not reason. A region, so there's not a separation right here. Your stomach, your, your liver, your pancreas, all of that, do they touch each other? Yes, they do. They do touch each other. In fact, they're all connected very tightly and, and close. So um, they all touch each other. They're all encased together. Another word that was on a previous slide that I need to bring up right now is the term viscera. Viscera, and um, because that's what we're going to talk about next. Viscera, briefly. Viscera just means organs. So when you hear the term organs, we call that viscera. If you hear the term viscera, they're just talking about organs. But that's the term that we use for the word organ. On these organs, or on the viscera that are separated, they're separated, they physically have a sac that separates them. And that's what that first lab is about. It has you go through that. The sac that physically separates them is called a serous membrane or the serosal membrane. This slide right here is very general, and then we'll get specific. What does visceral mean? It's organs, right. So the best way to demonstrate this, and normally I'm in a lab and I have all that, but I take a Ziploc bag and I put water in it, just a little bit of water. And then I take my hand and I put the bag here, and then I do this. So that, that Ziploc bag with water is around my hand. Okay, so I seal the bag. I'm not putting my hand in the bag. I'm putting that closed bag around my hand. There is one part of that Ziploc bag that's touching my hand. Okay? The part that is touching my hand is what we call the visceral layer. The part that actually touches the organ is called the visceral layer because it's touching the organ, and the organ is called the viscera. Fantastic. So we call that the visceral layer. The part of the bag that is not touching my hand, we call that the parietal layer. So it is not touching. Okay, the parietal layer does not touch. And what was in between those two layers? That I told you that I put it in that bag. Water, I put fluid. Why do you think it's necessary to put fluid in between these two layers that are constantly rubbing against each other? Produces friction, 100% reduces friction. There's fluid in all of those membranes because those organs don't just sit still, they're constantly moving and you're moving. And so in order to reduce friction and allow for no tearing and you have to keep everything nice and hydrated. So we have fluid there and we call that fluid serous fluid. So the membranes that surround these organs are called serous membranes. There are three parts to those serous membranes. The visceral layer is the one that actually touches the organ. 
The parietal layer is the one that's further away. And the serous fluid is the fluid in between the two that reduces friction. Okay? <clears throat> this is generally speaking. We get very specific because when I say serous membrane to a doctor, a doctor was like, well, which one? So if I'm talking about the heart, I call it the pericardium. And I call it the visceral pericardium. What's that? The visceral pericardium. The layer that's actually touching the heart. And if I say the parietal pericardium, the one that's not touching the heart. And if I say pericardial fluid, the, the fluid in between those two layers. But because I put pericardial in front of it, where am I talking about? The heart. There's no doubt. Does that make sense? We use these terms to add specificity to everything that we discuss. So that's what you're going to see here. So I just discussed the pericardium. But for the lungs, we call it the pleura. So we have the visceral pleura, the parietal pleura, and the pleural fluid. Okay? The, peritone, or the abdominal pelvic cavity, we call it the peritoneum. So you have the visceral peritoneum that's actually touching the organs. You have the parietal peritoneum that is not touching the organs. And then you have the peritoneal fluid that is allowing for them to reduce the friction and keep all those cells hydrated. Okay? So we use those terms to increase the specificity and tell exactly what we're talking about. So each of these is called a serous membrane, like what we just talked about. But I, can, I give them more specificity when I say the pericardium. So the pericardium is a serous membrane that surrounds the heart. The pleura is a serous membrane that surrounds the lungs. The peritoneum is a serous membrane that surrounds the abdominopelvic cavity. Questions or clarification here? I know it's a lot. Here is that example I was giving you for the heart. Yes, ma'am. Okay, quick question. Just Proceed. a clarification. Proceed. So the serious fluid, that's the fluid that, that would be in the bag that you're talking about. It's not. Yes, yes. Okay, that, okay. Yes, yes, yes. The, mm -hmm. okay. yes okay. ma'am. And the serous fluid, you're constantly making that. So, for example, if you get stabbed in the lungs and your lung collapses, once we can repair it, we've removed the object that impaled you, and we allow that endothelial tissue to um, heal, you'll make more fluid to fill that in. We're constantly recycling and remaking that fluid. So that's all fresh. It's not fluid that you've had your entire life. So it's fluid between the viscera. Viscera is organs. But the okay, fluid is minute. between the viscera the and parietal layers. layers. Yes, layers. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, ma so here shows you. Here would be that um, Ziploc bag that I went around that organ with. So here is the heart. This right here on the outside surface of the heart would be my visceral pericardium. The one further away would be my parietal pericardium. And in between the two is the pericardial fluid. Okay? Do you see how this right here separates the heart from all the other organs? That's literally the purpose of it. Okay? To keep that heart from all the other organs. Questions or clarification? Okay? Quadrants, left upper, right upper, left lower, right lower. I feel like those are really specific. Uh, you don't label a quadrant and say, oh, the quadrant with the gallbladder. You just say right upper quadrant, and that's right upper. Right lower, lower. Left and left. But remember, these are my right and left, and for you it would be the opposite. So make sure you're talking about your patient. Um, when you see this on your final exam, I'm not asking you what organ it is. I'm asking you what quadrant is it, okay? I'm not, I, again, I am not out to get you at all. If you study and do what you're supposed to do, this class is not difficult to make an A in. But you have to spend the time to do it. So I am not at any point trying to trick you at all. Whenever you're working with an anatomist or somebody who's specifically studying that, like an ME, a medical examiner, they don't use the four body quadrants, they use nine, because it gives them more specificity. It just depends on what, what view you want. So we have nine quadrants here. Okay. 
We reference the umbilical region. Everyone's pretty familiar with umbilical, so I'm going to start there. Epigastric. So epigastric, mean, epi means on the surface of, so the stomach, epigastric. That makes sense here. Left and right hypochondriac region. I don't know why it's called the hypochondriac region. Perhaps it's because a lot of people are like, oh, it hurts right here, and it's really nothing. But I don't, under, I, I don't truly know the story for why we call it the hypochondriac region. The right iliac, the top of your coxal bones, your hip bones, are called your ilium. So right ilium, left ilium, that makes perfect sense. And this has to be a complete typo because this should not be the public region. I'm pretty sure this should be pubic, but this is not my diagram and so I cannot manipulate it. But please do not make your pubic region a public region and let's just keep it a private region. Okay, so your nine areas. Again, on your practical, this diagram, I'm not asking for the organs, I'm asking for what region we're referencing. Okay? You have a lot of other body cavities, but not that we're going to study in great detail in this chapter. But anything that's exposed to the environment has to be protected. We're going to end up studying that in chapter 5 when we study the integumentary system. Synovial cavities are cavities that you find where your joints are, all of your... Um, joints. I, don't, I can't think of another word for them right this second. So anything that's not so exposed to the environment is synovial, but all of these right here are exposed to the environment. Okay, end of chapter one. Thank goodness. At 3.05, we'll start again. Wait, questions or clarification? Okay, fantastic. So chapter one, good.